just a couple of questions about the simulation. Uh, those uh, members of the two delegations, namely Saudi Arabia and Jordan, are you guys here? Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I mean the two standing. And how about Jordan? <laughs> well, I should call King Abdullah next time. All right. Um, please make sure you know your team members. I mean, I tried to sort of uh, introduce you to each other last time just by asking you to stand up so that everyone can see everybody else and knows, of course, uh, that he or she who is uh, his or her t team member. So it is essential that you get together as soon as possible, as I indicated in my emails, and devise a strategy as to how to f proceed. Next week, I will be attending uh, a conference in Paris on Thursday. So my, I'll be returning on Friday. We will not have class on Friday, but we will have class on Tuesday, right? Don't forget this. And um, don't spread the word that professor will not be here next week. I will not be here next Friday. I'll be here on Tuesday next week. So uh, pl please do not cause any misunderstanding. But um, for your convenience, I'm telling you right now that uh, next Friday's class will be canceled. Uh, and that's why that's the reason, as I explained at the beginning of the semester, we are having four hours uh, a week, at least for several weeks at the beginning of the semester, so as to be able to compensate for the sort of several hours that we'll be missing because of these conferences. Um, again, um, I was planning to show you a PowerPoint here. The computer, I mean, the, uh, there is a problem with the accounts. I cannot open my email account uh, in which I had this PowerPoint file sent to myself so that I could show it here. I did not have a copy last time, so but I have this sort of printed copy myself, but don't worry about it. You will get the PowerPoint as an attachment in, in, in an email that I will send you. So, I mean, please take notes because the PowerPoint uh, consists of some uh, bullet point type sort of information, not very much detail, just headlines, I mean, sort of headings, um, subheadings. But um, the information that I'll be discussing here uh, will be useful for you uh, in your preparation to the midterm exam, which is scheduled as far as I remember uh, November 12th, right? Right before the Byram. Um, all right. Excuse me? Hey, yeah, something? Or is there anything you would like to tell us, everyone? That week, so that will increase your adrenaline and you'll be working better. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, in case there is going to be trouble for most of the class, we can maybe think about another sort of a date, but I don't think this should be uh, necessary to discuss at this point. Anyway, um, last time we tried to sort of uh, determine the basic characteristics, the fundamental characteristics of the Middle East, because this is the subject, the, uh, the subject of this course. And we are, of course, particularly interested in the security dimension of the relations um, in the Middle East. And there are a number of factors that elevate Middle East to a very high position in international politics. And it is not a new phenomenon. It is, some, it is not something new. Middle East has been uh, one of the focus of international politics for quite some time. At least over the last century, the Middle East has been the a battleground, both, I mean, per se, in real sense, uh, where wars were fought, but also in political sense, where you know, uh, big powers, small powers have fought each other in order to advance their own interests. After all, as I always teach my, uh, in, <coughs> tell my students in my foreign policy analysis or Turkish foreign policy classes, foreign policy is the pursuit of national interest outside of the boundaries of that country. So, uh, therefore, um, we have seen many uh, countries trying to advance their interest and pursue their interest vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the advantages that they thought you know, uh, would emerge from 
being there or just uh, taking part in, in uh, regional uh, politics or regional uh, int or intra-regional sort of uh, politics. So um, today we are talking about Middle East because primarily because uh, of uh, natural resources, especially oil and gas that exist there and many countries in the world um, are sort of dependent on Middle Eastern sort of uh, oil as well as gas. And that, that, is, that is one particular reason why especially big powers both in the past and today have displayed a lot of interest um, in their sort of approach to Middle East. And they always wanted to uh, be in, in a more advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis other powers. And of course, uh, especially since the creation of the State of Israel, as we'll be dealing with uh, more in depth and extensively throughout the semester, and also um, more recently because of uh, more imminent security problems such as terrorism, Middle East again is in the focus of many, many countries. So therefore it is, uh, it is an important subject. But of course um, we can go, as I always say, as far back as many centuries in order to start or to set the clock, I mean, as to how to or where, where to start studying the Middle East. There is uh, ultimately no meaningful sort of, a, sort of a point or yardstick where you can just start history. The more uh, sort of uh, farther back you go, uh, and of course the more things you find uh, which are interesting for understanding and explaining what is going on in, in the Middle East. But of course, because it's not a course uh, or history course, history department course, and because we don't have much time and we want to devote much of our time to understanding contemporary issues uh, in the Middle East, we will start from uh, the post-World War II period. And we will look at the state of affairs in the immediate aftermath and also uh, I mean, the, the period uh, uh, since the World War II. So what was uh, or how was the Middle East uh, looking like at the time? What was the situation in the uh, state of affairs? What was the political situation? military situation, security situation in the Middle East uh, right after the World War II. Actually, there were some quick important developments following uh, the end of the World War II. Well, uh, the World War II, of course, is a, is a very important turning point in, uh, in history. Uh, there is no question about it. And the war itself and what followed afterwards uh, affected uh, many, many nations, many, many countries. New nations have born out of uh, big empires which have collapsed or um, some new relationship uh, uh, emerged between or among countries. One of which was, of course, the creation of this, uh, the League of Arab Nations. Well, that was actually something that preceded the official or formal end of the war because it was in March 1945. Uh, but something that is, of course, important to bear in mind is that many of the developments that follow the official end of war had their uh, sort of origins in the years uh, which uh, sort of uh, uh, in the years uh, when still war was still going on, such as the creation of the state of uh, creation of the United Nations. Many conferences were carried out among nations and some other institutions that would, again, follow the end of the war. Um, the League of Arab Nations, or Arab League, so to speak, uh, is, is one of the important developments that we have to bear in mind and still exists. It was uh, started with uh, six countries. And today, is there anybody who has any idea about how many members uh, the Arab League has? Or approximately, you don't have to be very exact. I mean, can you give a number within a range like today, how many Arab nations are members of the Arab League? 50 or 15? Who said 50? And you said 50. <laughs> Far too much, 50. I don't think there are 50 Arab nations today. 15 is, well, uh, not so bad. It's now there are 22 
Arab nations who are members of the Arab League. Um, <clears throat> is it a very important uh, organization? Well, it depends on where you, look, where you stand and uh, from which perspective you look at issues and what you expect from the Arab League. Uh, in its, of course, you have to go through its charter in order to understand the mission and, and the powers of the Arab League as to what it is supposed to do and what it aims at uh, achieving or what is its ultimate goal. Of course, one particular thing, as the name suggests, is to uh, sort of uh, create a more coherent relationship uh, uh, among the Arab nations. Uh, maybe emphasize or strengthen Arab uh, 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 identity and help spread this understanding among the Arab nations because there are some countries where almost uh, the entire population is Arab. There is no sort of a significant number of percentage of minorities. Uh, but there are also some countries where Arabs are also in minorities such as Israel, for instance, there are approximately 20% of Israeli population today is Arab, but Israel uh, is not an, a member of the Arab League. Well, this is something that would be pretty much uh, unthinkable for, for the Israelis. Um, even though they have, as I said, one-fifth of their population today, which is not a significant, uh, uh, so insignificant proportion. It is a significant proportion, but still, of course, due to other reasons, not only because of this uh, proportion. Uh, the uh, Israel is, of course, not an Arab League member, but there are also some countries w such as um, Iraq, for instance. Again, they're like 16, 17 percent, or according to some other figures, 20 percent of the uh, population is non Arab uh, identity, such as the Kurds, but it is uh, has been uh, not only a founding member, but also one of the most important uh, members of the Arab League. It, it doesn't have uh, binding power on, on the nations. It aims at achieving certain goals through negotiation and also a consensus uh, finding, and this is therefore important. That, that is something that tells us about the post-World War II period, uh, uh, in that Arab nations have in a sense, develop a sense of uh, Arab identity and, and, and that they, they sort of figured out it was important for them to emphasize it. This is therefore one important development. Of course, one very important development that uh, followed the end of the uh, World War II uh, was the creation of the State of Israel. On May 15, 1948, uh, Israel proclaimed independence. Of course, there is much uh, uh, history to this. I mean, it, it is not something that happened overnight. That was a dream for at least several centuries uh, uh, back in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. And this Zionist movement always aimed at creating a, a, a nation for the Jews who were being persecuted everywhere, almost everywhere in, the, in all parts of the world. And, uh, but, of course, and there were some significant developments, some, some important stages that have paved the way to this uh, ultimate uh, decision. And, of course, the, uh, the Jews have taken advantage of the United Nations resolution, which actually uh, aimed at creation of a state uh, for the Jews as well as for the Palestinians, because the territory that Israel today exists is Palestine, which was actually ruled for several centuries by the Ottomans. And uh, this is a period where, uh, which actually even the Israelis today uh, sort of uh, believe was a, a very significant period in history in, in the sense that Ottomans have kept peace and stability in this region where there is all these different ethnic religious identities which are prone and also have actually fought each other and prone to fight each other. So therefore the uh, creation of the State of Israel in many respects uh, constitutes one of the most important uh, stages in history 
of the world as well as and more specifically history of the Middle East. And according to many, it's the beginning of everything in the Middle East, depending on, again, how you look at the issue. Um, this is something that uh, paved the way uh, to very important developments, as I mentioned, and one of which, of course, a series of wars between the Arab nations, which aimed at you know, coming together and you know, uh, in a coherent way sort of uh, strengthen their position and create a, a sort of a, some sort of a unity among themselves. And this Arab identity, of course, uh, could not and did not accept the creation of State of Israel and they launched you know, uh, offensive against Israel, which, uh, of course, uh, resulted not necessarily uh, in, a, uh, in a victory uh, for themselves, for, for, for the Arab nations. And almost each time Arabs have fought the uh, Israelis, um, they pretty much suffer the consequences in terms of regime change or in terms of uh, sort of a shift of power from one group to another uh, sort of uh, in, in within themselves. So we will look into this uh, more closely because th these are important developments that have shaped actually uh, the rest of the uh, decades that follow the end of World War II, especially in 70s and 80s, we see a certain degree of radicalization uh, of the Middle East and some of the Middle Eastern nations or the, the relationship uh, among the Arab nations as well as between Arabs and uh, Israel. And we see more uh, sort of uh, intervention into the region by extra regional powers, superpowers, and sort of uh, peripheral powers, such as Iran, for instance. Turkey, for the most part of this period, I would say, the, throughout the uh, or post Second World War period, up until recently, almost pretty much, I mean, uh, in most cases, stood outside of the Middle Eastern politics for several reasons that we'll explain uh, in due course. But uh, other countries like uh, Iran, of course, Israel has always been unavoidably in the Middle Eastern politics. Um, one, of course, uh, one important development throughout these years in the 60s and 70s, uh, late starting from late 50s, all of which had their precedents, of course, all of which had their uh, reasons uh, of their own such as the rise of uh, a pan-Arabic ideology or Arab socialism uh, in the hands of uh, Nasser, Jamal Abdul Nasser, uh, uh, the head of state uh, Egypt, who came to power, of course, as a result of uh, some of the events that succeeded the uh, military coup uh, carried out by a number of military people. Of course, um, this, these are important uh, topics that we will be going on. One particular development that we should bear in mind is that throughout history, and at least for the uh, last several centuries, we have seen or we meant Great Britain and France particularly, to some extent, Germans tried to play a role, but they were not that much successful. But fr French and British were used to be the uh, great powers of the period uh, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And they always exerted their influence on the region. And this is somewhat, well, this, this map is not a very good one. I therefore found one on the in internet. and sent to my account, which I couldn't open today, which I would think would uh, better display uh, the situation that would be give you a better idea. But still, uh, of course, the world is uh, spherical. And some maps are so flat that people think it's all the way you know, uh, straightforward. But here, um, for France and Britain, I mean, because they had interest in uh, India, for especially the British and French in southeastern uh, um, Asia, and some in some other parts, 
Middle East has been on the crossroads or has been on the on the on the way to their sort of ultimate uh, uh, destination, and that was more, of course, not only to extend their sort of a political influence to as many regions as possible, but of course, out of this or based on this or taking advantage of this to make trade and to sort of uh, make import or export of certain goods and more specific, of course, import of raw material and, and manufacture, uh, using their manufacturing of some goods and, of course, uh, become a, a welfare nation. This is what capitalist powers in the past or imperial powers have done and this is therefore something not new to you. Uh, but here what we have seen in the particular period that we are, period that we are going to um, talk about, I mean the uh, more contemporary uh, period, is that we see the decline of these two powers as major powers. The, the post-World War II uh, period witnessed the decline of the British and French rules in the Middle East as well. But more so maybe in the farther regions of the world, such as India, for instance, and we have seen India and later on Pakistan uh, emerging as independent powers, uh, so, and which were previously uh, ruled by the British, and this colonial rule was uh, dis or di disappear with the free will of the British, maybe on the surface. But of course, there was there were a lot of reasons as to why the British have left or uh, quit the region. We we have not seen uh, the same development here in the Middle East for another period, like. Uh, up until the 60s, the Brits and the French were not necessarily so anxious to give up their uh, privileges here of ruling these regions because uh, not only that these regions were still were rather closer when compared to other parts, so therefore they could still you know, exert some influence, they could still project their power on these closer regions, but also uh, uh, because uh, of, again, the creation of State of Israel and some other sort of developments and oil and gas. Uh, these regions were so rich that could not be compared to the wealth in other regions. So uh, they were still jealous. They were still not very much willing to give up their powers. But all in all, what we have seen gradually and eventually, erosion of their powers, erosion of their influence, and they had no other choice but to um, sort of lead the region. And one particular development was, of course, the uh, Suez Canal crisis, which was followed by, of course, uh, maybe because of the reaction of the United States to the uh, sort of uh, triumvirate, I mean, this, this uh, uh, Israel, France, and, and Britain, who, as a reaction to Nasser's closure of the uh, canal and nationalization of the canal, and then sort of a fought or launched an offensive against Egypt, they did not expect a reaction from the United States and the Soviet Union, of course. So uh, this reaction caused uh, deep trauma in the uh, uh, mindset of the French, British, and as well as Israeli politicians, and and they have sort of uh, looked at the region with a new sort of uh, perspective, and they have then figured out that, that they could not still exert uh, uh, the influence that they used to do so in the past, and that they were going, and the United States was emerging as a power as a regional power as well, in addition to being a global power. Well, the 50s uh, is important in the sense that uh, there were some uh, uh, approaches of the U.S. administration under Eisenhower. There is this new deal. There is this uh, a new approach to many international issues, such as uh, in 1953. 
uh, with respect to nuclear energy, the spread of nuclear energy, and there is this uh, famous Atoms for Peace speech at the United Nations General Assembly and things like that. So many developments in the 50s have again witnessed uh, that Middle East uh, was not going to be anymore uh, a region where Brits and French were so much or as uh, as much as they used to do uh, uh, you know exert their influence but the United States was replacing them so that was a, an important note to bear in mind that British and French rules were in the decline and US uh, was uh, rising as the power, the extra regional power, outside power, which would, you know, somehow shape the future of the uh, intra-regional politics together with the Soviet Union. I mean, we should not forget the fact that, yes, in the 1950s, the Soviet Union uh, may not have had as much military capability as the United States had, but in the following years, in the, throughout the 60s, there was a you know pretty much uh, a parity between the two, and both of which have uh, taken advantage of this situation. And we talk about a superpower rivalry in all parts of the world, and more specifically in the Middle East. So, starting from the late 50s and early 60s, the Middle East has become more uh, sort of uh, uh, exerted. I mean, there was much uh, sort of influence of these rivalry between the two superpowers on the region, on, on the Middle East. Um, again, of course, this uh, period uh, tells us that more and more Arab nations have won their independence. Yes, uh, there were some developments in the 1920s, as we discussed here, uh, some boundaries were artificially drawn by the outside powers, French, British, Sykes-Picot, I mean, in 1916. All of these developments have had their effects throughout the 1920s and 30s. And, but during the Second World War, many things were uh, paused. I mean, there was a sort of a kind of standstill position, which, of course, uh, uh, was an unavoidable consequence of the war, which lasted for five, six years. And in, in its aftermath, we have seen these radical developments, and with the decline of the French and British rules, we have seen in the, uh, in the more and more independent nations, uh, I mean, Arab nations who have won their independence from the declining powers. So it was also a consequence of, of course, as I mentioned, a, of the U.S. intervention and also the Soviet uh, intervention in the region. Um, one impact of uh, the creation of State of Israel, as I mentioned, was the start of a series of wars between Israel. Almost on the day they proclaimed independence, they were attacked by Arab nations who could by no means accept this. Uh, therefore, we have seen wars, 48, 49, just uh, right after the creation of State of Israel. and. Of course, uh, Israel, in, in some respects, was not only um, spiritually or mentally uh, ready for such a, such a reaction. They were not dreaming that they would be welcome in the region. So they were not only re ready uh, politically, but also militarily. So, and they could just uh, uh, survive these attacks. But uh, m most important of which was uh, the war in 19, of course, uh, 48. I mean, the beginning followed by 67, uh, 73. These are the major wars. And the state of war actually has never ended between Arab nations and Israel. There, there is still n not an eternal peace, not a peace at all. Uh, only a handful of nations, just a few of them, uh, in the Arab world recognize the state of Israel formally. Some have not recognized uh, officially, but acknowledge uh, or at least act in such a way to sort of uh, acknowledge that there is this 
entity there, political entity, with which through indirect fashion, in, indirect sort of uh, means and uh, ways, do some trade and enter into some cultural, political relations. But uh, again, uh, only a handful of nations, uh, just a few nations in the Arab, among the Arab states uh, recognize the state of Israel, even today. And we do not see much prospects in the future, or in the near future at least. Of course, uh, we would uh, hope for the opposite. The, because uh, Israel was created in, the, uh, in Palestine, in, the, in a region where uh, Palestinians were living together by, uh, side by side with uh, the Jews, and the Jews have taken advantage of creating their own state, but the Palestinians have failed to do so, Palestinians who had no nation, no state, of course, were directly affected from this situation. And we have seen during the war and its aftermath, we have seen a, a sort of a, a large uh, a, a sort of mobilization or movement of large number of Palestinians going to many nations, to, to many states in the region, one of which was primarily known as Transjordan, and today, as we know, Jordan. So today, I don't have the exact figures in mind, but an overwhelming majority of Jordan, uh, Jordanian population consists of Palestinians. And some historians and politicians argue that there is actually no such a Jordanian nation, but which is something not accepted by Jordanians and that there is a distinct Jordanian entity. The name, of course, comes from the River Jordan, or Jordan River, uh, which was again you know, created uh, by drawing some maps by the big powers earlier, and based on some of the promises that were given before and during the wars, uh, Second World War especially. And, but what is important today is that one particular consequence of this war between Arabs and Israelis is that uh, the Palestinians were most, uh, most affected and, of course, uh, badly affected. Another one, of course, uh, at the time, I mean, there were uh, kings, emirs, sheikhs, such individuals who were ruling the sort of uh, Arab people in the Middle East. And there, or, I mean, Middle East uh, was consisting of such dynasties which were sort of uh, keeping control of their population and which had some, of course, legitimacy maybe in the eyes of uh, uh, some other powers, outside powers, maybe also uh, among their population. But the war uh, showed unequivocally that they were not that strong entities. And that followed by the war, or in, right in the aftermath of the war, these uh, dynasties have gone into trouble because they could not sort of uh, uh, protect their people and they could not protect their position, their, their power, their sort of status. And that, of course, has led the way to the creation of uh, or emergence of new regimes in the region taken over by mostly Dimitri. And once Dimitri intervened in it, in the situations, and Dimitri within itself created other problems and sort of paved the way to other interventions by other members of Dimitri who have blamed their predecessor for not being successful or for not being as strong or as tough as they had to be against, uh, of course, uh, Israel. So what we have seen in uh, countries like Egypt, Iraq, and Syria was that kingdoms or kings or monarchs, uh, dynasty powers, let's so to speak, have been toppled down by Dimitri. And then Dimitri rules, Dimitri regimes were established, which, again, as I said, within themselves have uh, undergone uh, several problems because uh, Everyone wanted to hold on to power and become the dominant actor in the uh, sort of administration of his country. So um, let's uh, give a short break here.
and I'll come back. When we come back, we'll discuss this issue, and I'll try to figure out if we can open this account today. <laughs>